This is the Daily Signal podcast for Wednesday, October 30th. I'm Rachel Del Judas. And I'm Kate Trinko. What would you say if your adult child told you he was transgender? Lynn Meager has had that conversation twice. She joins the podcast to share her story and her advice on resources for other parents in the same situation. And don't forget, if you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave a review or a five-star rating on iTunes and encourage others to subscribe. Now on to our top news. On Tuesday, a new witness testified during a closed-door hearing related to the impeachment proceedings. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Vindman first came to the United States as a toddler, his parents refugees from the Soviet Union. Vindman currently serves on the National Security Council and covers Ukraine in that role. In his opening statement before Congress, which was released, Vindman says he was listening in to President Trump's call on July 25th to Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky. He writes, I was concerned by the call. I did not think it was proper to demand that a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen, and I was worried about the implications for the U.S. government's support of Ukraine. I realized that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the Bidens and Burisma, it would likely be interpreted as a partisan play, which would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing the bipartisan support it has thus far maintained. This would all undermine U.S. national security. Following the call, I again reported my concerns to the National Security Council's lead counsel. President Trump tweeted Tuesday, Supposedly, according to the corrupt media, the Ukraine call concerned today's never-Trumper witness. Was he on the same call that I was? Can't be possible. Please ask him to read the transcript of the call. Witch hunt. And... How many more never-Trumpers will be allowed to testify about a perfectly appropriate phone call when all anyone has to do is read the transcript? I knew people were listening in on the call. Why would I say something inappropriate? Which was fine with me. But why so many? Representative Liz Cheney, Republican of Wyoming and the number three in GOP House leadership, defended Vindman on Tuesday. Here's what she had to say via The Hill. I also want to say a word about something else that's been going on over the course of the last several hours and and last night, uh, which I think is also shameful. And that is questioning the patriotism, questioning the dedication to country of people uh, like Mr. Vindman, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who will be coming today, um, and others who have testified. Uh, I think that we need to show that we are better than that as a nation. It is shameful to question their patriotism, their love of this nation, and we should not be involved in that process. Republican Congressman Doug Collins of Georgia says Democrats' push to impeach President Donald Trump is a sham after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Monday that the House would be voting Thursday on an impeachment resolution that lays out parameters for the process. Here's what Collins told Fox News Tuesday morning. I mean, here we are again in Washington, D.C., when we should be doing the people's business. And now we've had another change of heart by Speaker Pelosi, who's now decided that everything that they've been doing for the last three weeks was wrong. We've been telling them it's wrong. We gave them plenty of notice that it was wrong and not fair to the American people or fair to the president. So now she's decided that the Republicans are really wrong, but we're going to vote to do something. We haven't seen the text yet. In fact, they had to write it all night last night. That shows you how desperate they are. So we'll see what happens on Thursday. This is a sham. It's not this is something to simply cover their problems that they've had with this investigation all along, putting Adam Schiff in a closed room, leaking out stuff that he wants to leak out, and making it appear to be something it's not. We'll see the uh, Republicans vote against this because, again, you can't fix. Another win for the U.S. fight against ISIS. President Trump tweeted Tuesday, just confirmed that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's number one replacement has been terminated by American troops, most likely would have taken the top spot. Now, He is also dead. Teens are spending double the time watching videos and online entertainment now than they were in 2015, according to a report from Common Sense Media. The report found that the time teens spend on their screens went up by 42 minutes a day since 2015, and almost 62% of teens spend over four hours each day watching media on their screens. Additionally, since 2015, 
29% of teens use their screens for over eight hours each day. Next up, we'll feature my interview with a mom who's twice had children tell her that they are transgender. Do conversations about the Supreme Court leave you scratching your head? If you want to understand what's happening at the court, subscribe to SCOTUS 101, a Heritage Foundation podcast breaking down the cases, personalities, and gossip at the Supreme Court. So, we're at the Values Voters Summit with Lynn Meager. Lynn, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Lynn, you were speaking at the Values Voters Summit on transgender issues, and you have your own personal experience with this in your family. So tell me about that. Well, um, I have um, unfortunately lost um, two of my children to the transgender cult. I call it a cult, and it really has some very cult-like um, characteristics to it. Um, so it's been a very painful journey for me. Um, and um, so I have learned a lot through that journey. But, yeah. So how old were your children when they decided that they were transgender? They were both college age, um, which is something that's not talked about a lot. But a lot of kids um, come home from college and tell their parents that they're trans. Um, the trans um, narrative is... Um, promoted on college campuses deeply. There's like basically trans dorms, there's um, trans health care, there's trans clubs. Um, and uh, my kids weren't actually in college at the time, but it's, a, it's actually a really common age for kids to um, decide that they're transgender. And the hard thing about, um, about it happening at that age is um, you don't really have a whole lot of control. There's not really anything you can do about it. They're adults, they get to make their own decisions, and you just have to kind of watch it happen, kind of like a slow motion car wreck, you know. Um, So that's, that was my story. So you said your kids were older than college, were they in their 20s? Yeah, they were like, they were both 21. 21, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're comfortable sharing, how how did they approach you? Did they approach it as a done fact? Did they say, I'm thinking about this? Or how did those conversations go? It was a done fact. Yeah. And had there ever been anything in their past or when they were children that suggested they were uncomfortable with their biological sex? Not that I or anyone else that knew them could see, no. So how did you feel, especially when the first one told you? Um, Well, when my son told me that he was trans, it was 2003. And this wasn't really a thing yet. Nobody knew anything about it. And it was, um, I mean, it was devastating and confusing and um, just shocking and I, I didn't know what to think um, and um, and then last year when my daughter um, when I found out about my daughter it was I mean because I'd already kind of experienced it and I'd been involved in um, <clears throat> kind of in the issue through my work with hands across the aisle and um, so I, I was quite knowledgeable about the issue, so it was, it was really devastating for me. Um, and unfortunately, my daughter broke off her relationship with me as soon as I found out. So I've never actually had an opportunity to have one conversation with her about it. She didn't give me that opportunity. So even with her, you just never saw any signs of gender no. confusion? No, she, um, she went to cosmetology school. Um, she loves makeup. Um, she rode horses. She had sleepovers. She, she was a girl all her life. So you just mentioned that you work with Hands Across the Aisle. Can you mm-hmm. explain to our audience what that is and what your work is with them? Sure. Hands Across the Aisle is a, um, a coalition of women um, who have reached out across every political and ideological um, persuasion to work together to fight the um, gender ideology madness that's overtaken our culture. So we have radical feminists and Christians and lesbians and um, all kinds of people working together and we just lay aside all our differences and we work on this and it's, it's been a real growth experience I mean, for all of us. So we've done interviews at Daily Signal with members of Hands Across the Aisle before, uh-huh. and it's just fascinating with the dynamic you described to me, like people who probably disagree on 95% of the issues. But on this one, why, why do you think you're able to find common ground on this issue? I think it's because we so passionately care 
about um, not only about children but about women. Um, the the feminist members of our groups, they're um, they're largely passionate about um, about women and girls, um, safe spaces for women. Um, but whatever our you know whatever our personal reason for being so passionate about this issue, um, it really does transcend any other issue that we really could have in this time. I believe that this is this is an this is an emergency. Um, if you if you're in a fire, you don't only pull some of the people out of the house. You go get everybody. And across our world, there are kids being <clears throat> sterilized and mutilated and damaged for life. And there are women losing their spaces and their opportunities. There's girls losing their sports scholarships. There's I mean I could go on, but um, this is a big deal. So you referred to the trans <clears throat> cult earlier. Could you expand on why you think of it that way? Well, um, in a cult, you have um, you have a an ideology or a thought. In, in in a typical cult, you have a leader. That's the, really the only thing that this is missing. So instead of like a personal leader, it's more of a like an ideology type thing. Um, but typically, then um, the members begin to identify very strongly only with the other people in the cult who agree with them. They have mantras that they say over and over again. Some of the um, trans mantras you might know. Trans women are women. Have you heard that before? Yeah. There's a reason. They have mantras like a cult. Um, they are told that um, anyone who doesn't agree with them is um, dangerous to them. That's because if they talk reasonably with any any reasonable discussion about this will in in just a matter of moments tear it down and so they can't really be exposed to those rational ideas so there's really no alternative for them but to to band together and cut the world out um so as soon as you um, try to engage or talk about this, they just start screaming that you're a hater and you're a bigot and you're a transphobe and you're trying to erase them. And I mean, you can't have a, you can't have a discussion about this. You just can't. Um, uh, Rachel McKinnon was um, <clears throat> famous for uh, her Mother's Day speech, where she told kids that if their if their family doesn't accept them. It's perfectly okay to leave their family and join her glitter family. Um, and if that's not cult talk, I really don't know what is. So I think one of the baffling things that we've encountered in modern at modern times in the past few years, really, is the amount of kids who seem to be identifying as transgender yes. or, you know, maybe something else on the LGBTQ mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. area. And it's, you know, huge numbers. I believe a study showed at one school or someone was saying anecdotally that a quarter of kids identified this way. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a contagion going on? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> It, it, it happens so often that, you know, a kid is trying to find a place to fit in. Um, a lot of these kids are kids that have, you know, they have troubles. They're, um, they're on the autism spectrum. They're a little bit different. They're maybe a little socially awkward. Um, maybe they're just really, really smart. That was my kids never fit in because they were they were really, really smart. And they were kind of, you know, they kind of had some social, you know, difficulties. Um, and... Um, a lot of these kids have um, concurrent mental health issues, um, and they they find a place to fit in. Because as soon as you as soon as you say that you're trans, you get love bombed. You get love bombed online. You get love bombed on, at school. Um, your social status goes up by at least ten ranks. As soon as you say you're trans, you turn into a star. Um, and you know, kids are thirsty for that kind of affirmation. Um, and as well, most of us can probably remember um, puberty and um, the awkwardness that comes with it. The yeah, not a great time. <laughs> it is. It's a hard time. And so they're, they're struggling with the way their body is changing. You know, the girls are like, oh, I'm, I'm growing breasts and I hate it. And I have to, I have to wear a bra. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and all these changes are happening to your body and you feel really weird. 
And, you know, it's, it's a really, it's always been an awkward, difficult time. Now, when these kids express that they feel funny about their body and, you know, they don't really like how it's changing, they're immediately told, well, you know, the reason you feel so awkward is you're really a man. And, you know, you can, you can, you can stop all these changes. They don't have to happen to you. Right. You cannot tell me or any rational person that one quarter of of any kids in any school are really actually born in the wrong body and they're transgender. I mean, that's just not rational. So what would your advice be to parents if their child, and let's say their child is, you know, above 18, <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, like your situation, and they come to, to the parents and say, I think I'm transgender or I mm-hmm. am transgender. Yeah. How would you recommend parents handle that? Oh, boy. Well, it's really a tough situation. First of all, you need some support. A lot of times it's really hard because you can't find you can't find any support. You don't know anybody in your life that knows anything about it. Um, if you look online, every single resource that you find if you look online will be um, what they call affirmative or, you know, agreeing that your child is trans. And um, so um, if... If you're not, if you're doubting that story and um, you want the other side, you, you really can't even find it by Googling. You can't find it. So um, <clears throat> there's a couple of there's a couple of places online. There's a um, blog called Fourth Wave Now. It's uh, four t h w a v e n o w dot com or is it dot org? I can't remember. But it's Fourth Wave Now. That's a block with a lot of um, articles and information, and you know, parents can write. It, it's a public forum, so it's not really designed to be basically a support group. There's also the Kelsey Coalition, which is a group of parents that are um, supporting each other and acting in concrete ways to um, try to stop this. Um, there's a group called the Parents of ROGD Kids, which is um, an in-person support group type thing, and there are chapters opening up all over the U.S. Um, there's a British blog called um, Transgender Trend that's really good. And um, so, you know, there are resources. You just really have to know what they are. You have to know how to look for them. As far as relating to your child, I would highly recommend that you do everything you can to maintain your relationship with your child. And that is a very tough, tight line to walk. It's just almost impossible. Um, Somehow um, you have to gently but firmly in the best way you can just express that you, you care about them, you love them, you can't agree with it. Whether you decide to use their pronouns or not is a personal decision. I, I just was unable to do it. I felt like I was lying. I really can't tell anyone what to do in their own situation. It's really tough. But um, one thing that doesn't really seem to work is um, a lot of argument or um, pressure or presenting them with information, making them read articles, making them talk to people. And whatever you do, don't take them to a gender clinic. Um, don't. The hard thing is you can't. And a lot of times you can't take them to counseling because in a lot of states there's a therapy ban. And if you take them, your troubled kid to counseling, they'll be inside the gender clinic before you know it on hormones. And you will be shut out of the process. You will have no input. You won't, you won't be able to stop the train. Um, so that's really tough. Um, you know, sometimes if you gently, and gen- you know, if you just ask around with other parents that are in your area... You can find someone who will treat your kid um, that's um, rational and (laughs) not gender affirming. Um, Sometimes that's really a struggle. Um, There's a few people that do it online, um, over the phone. Um, So, you know, I think... And then, and then try to remember. A lot of times, this is a this is a self limiting thing. A lot of times, after five years or so. It kind of cycles out if you can just hold on. Um, just try to be there for your child. I mean, I don't. I, it's very hard. So there's so much pressure on parents these days from the media and others that say unless you 
immediately embrace your child as transgender. Your child is at risk for depression or even, God forbid, suicide. Mm -hmm. How would you, what do you think about those charges? How do parents sort of walk that line? Okay, well, I first of all, I have to say that that is the worst kind of emotional blackmail that I have ever heard of. And that, that is, we don't emotionally blackmail people and tell them that if you, know, if you don't give me my way, I'm going to kill myself. And you don't do that to parents. Um, so the study that's frequently cited says 41% of transgender kids ha- are, basically they try to tell parents that, you know, 41% of the time your kid's going to kill themselves. This was a really flawed study. And all the studies that they try to claim, if you know anything about science, statistics, um, and, and doing studies in the right way, they are so, these studies are, they're garbage. They're, they're junk science. They decide, first of all, what they want the study to say, and then they design the study to say that. Um, so basically, they, add, they took a random, just like sampling, of um, trans kids, and they said, have you ever thought about killing yourself in the last year? Have you ever thought about it? I've thought about doing a lot of things that I'm not going to do, okay? And these are kids that a lot of them have very complex mental health issues to start with. Um, So, yeah, maybe they've thought about it. to be honest, I've thought about it. <laughs> I lost my kids. I, it's hard to find a you know, reason to keep living, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. So, I mean, that's not a that's not a scientific study. Just to ask some kids, have a generalized, really wide open question like that. Have you thought about? Have you thought about ending your life? And then they make that study sound like 41 percent of kids actually will end their life, which is not true um, statistically. Um, there, there is, there is a somewhat higher chance, but it, it is not 41 percent. Um, so I, I think I find that emotional blackmail line to be incredibly irresponsible. And is there anything parents can do? Because you know, as you've just mentioned, this is an extremely stressful situation for a mm-hmm. parent. Mm-hmm. How can parents, you know, get the support they need as they're going through this? Well, you you really do have to find you have to find support yourself. You have to like the sources that I mentioned. Um, it's really important to find people that um, have walked this line before you and people that understand the process. A lot of times, parents are, you know, it's a crash course. They you know they don't really know anything about this, and all of a sudden, it's the middle of their lives. And so, it's really helpful to um, have some people around you. Um, and I think that that's the number one thing. A lot of parents find some, you know, a little bit of help in trying to help other people. That's been really helpful to me. So I I became a parent advocate. Um, I've started a Facebook support group. Um, I travel around. I I go to conferences. I I speak out. I educate people. Um, To me, that puts a little bit of meaning in it, if I guess. I mean, it's not like you can just go on and act like it didn't happen, you know, like life is still normal. It, it's not. Um, so I'd say, um, and also try to take care of you um, because um, your child needs you, and they need you to be healthy and whole. They need you to be strong, and you can't do that if you're completely, um, if you're completely underwater worrying about your child um you ha- you have to take care of you too and so um just remember that you know you you need and deserve um a good life and some self-care and some support and um you know you, it's not your fault you didn't cause this um a lot of times parents are just overwhelmed They're like, what did i do did i say the wrong thing did i you know, did I not, you know, was I, did I miss something? Was there something I should have noticed? And, you know, it's, it's really, not, it's not your fault. Is there anything, and I'm not saying this is, means that it can be prevented, but is there anything parents can do to try to help their kids be more secure in their biological sex or get them ready before college for this onslaught of propaganda? Hmm. 
Well, I think that foreknowledge is is really helpful. You know, we need to talk about this issue. Um, we need, you know, being proactive sometimes is, you know, um, making sure your kids understand um, the issue, even though it's a really hard one to talk about. Um, they're going to hear about it. Um, and um, whatever you do, don't let your kids go on Tumblr. Is Tumblr a place where a lot of this is? Tumblr is a cesspool. <laughs> There are people on Tumblr just going around looking for distressed kids and trying to pick them into the, pull them into the cult, seriously. Um, some other really bad ones, DeviantArt, a lot of artistic kids do this. Um, there's a one called Fan Fiction, where they write stories for each other. It's a lot of that on that. Uh, Reddit is pretty bad. Um, and, you know, I'm an old lady, so there's probably new ones that I don't know about. Those are the, those are the big ones that I've heard a lot. So um, watch what your kid's doing online, seriously. Um, and then, you know, we really have to, um, we have really got to get to the place where we, um, where we, first of all, accept our own bodies for what they are. We do a lot of body shaming in this culture. I'm fat, I'm too short. You know, if you're worrying about your body all the time, what do you think your child is doing? Um, acceptance of themselves, acceptance of their bodies the way they are, um, allowing them, you know, if they have some differences and some hobbies that aren't gender stereotypical, they need to know that, you know, some girls like to do motocross, and there's lots of ways to be a girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every single time someone says, I, you know, I'm trans, it's because... I, I like the clothes, I like the sports, I like the activities, I like the haircut. It's all this gender role stereotype stuff that we thought we were getting away from. And it mystifies me that all of a sudden these gender stereotypes are the center of freedom for people. or It's this huge, huge thing. You never hear anyone describing their, their thought that they're transgender with any other thing but these stereotypes. So, you know, girls need to know that, like I said, that there are a million ways to be a girl. And you're not a girl because you feel like one. You're a girl because you are. Um, and um, it's very hard to resist, for them to resist this new ideology that gender is a spectrum. And, you know, one, st one, one um, study said that... Um, there's, there's like over a hundred genders now, supposedly. They keep making up new ones. Well, there's not a there's not hundred genders, but there are 500 billion personalities. Um, you know, be yourself, but love your body the way it is. Because no child is born in the wrong body. We are all born in exactly the right body. And fighting your body for the rest of your life is an incredibly heavy chain to put around the neck of any young person. And I would say shame on this culture. Shame on you all. I, I don't know how, how, how dare the schools and the libraries and the doctors and the psychologists and the media and all these other people, how dare they tell children that there's something wrong with their body? I, you know, I, I just... Um... I don't know how we got here, um, but you know, hold your hold your kids tight and um, keep telling them they're all right, whoever they are. That's such a powerful point, and I, I really like the point you made about you know, there's a, a lot of different ways to be a girl or to be a boy because yeah. I agree that you often see when people identify as transgender, they take the most stereotypical male or female and it's sort of like well you could you know it might not be my favorite thing but you can be a boy and wear nail polish you can yeah. be a girl and have very short hair yeah. those are not Doesn't incompatible mean, does not mean you need to chop your body up and take hormones um and a lot of these kids too are struggling with um with um sexual orientation um and they are trying to make sense of their feelings in that arena um and, um, you know, I don't know of anything more homophobic than deciding that you can't be a lesbian, so you must be a man. Absolutely. Um, 
th- that is that is the greatest homophobia that that ever was. Um, you know, I mean that that's um, it's a tragedy that a girl would feel that she has to um, she has to have a mastectomy and a hysterectomy. Um, she has to have a beard, um, and, and you know, rather than just kind of figuring out who she is in her own body, um, I think we just we just need to stop. We just need to stop this. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, Lynn. thank you too. Okay, we appreciate right. having you coming on. Oh, thanks. And that'll do it for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Daily Signal podcast brought to you from the Robert H. Bruce Radio Studio at the Heritage Foundation. Please be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, and please leave us a review or a rating on iTunes to give us any feedback. We'll see you again tomorrow. The Daily Signal podcast is executive produced by Kate Trinko and Daniel Davis. Sound designed by Lauren Evans and Thalia Rampersad. For more information, visit DailySignal.com.